everybody. Thank you all so much for coming today. Uh, this is the uh, first time we've done anything like this before, so it's really exciting. Try something new. Um, the way that tonight is going to work uh, is I'm from AMP, and AMP is uh, the Student Organization Center for Amplifying the Arts. We are out of the Arts Management Program in, at Eastern. And uh, May is one of our uh, graduate students. This is May, and this is uh, part of her graduate thesis. So um, tonight, we're going to start with um, Dr. Foley from the uh, geology and, ge and geography and geology. Geography and geology. <laughs> I want to mix them up. Department of Science, and she's very gracious. She's going to do a um, presentation on uh, global warming and climate change. And then May is going to step up and do uh, a presentation for you guys about the public art project that coincides with the presentation, which is a public art competition. Okay, and I think that's it. Anything else? No, that's it. Well, enjoy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for coming tonight. Much nicer evening than a week ago when the event was originally scheduled. Thank you, May, for inviting me. Um, my field of expertise is paleoclimatology. So I am a geology who studies ancient climate, climate of the past. And uh, so I come to global warming with a lengthy background of how climate has changed in the past. So today we're going to talk about climate change and a specific aspect of climate change, which is global warming. I will give you an idea of what climate is and how it works. I promise I'll try my best to keep it short. And then we will take a look at consequences uh, of global warming. And in the end, we will take a quick look at what can be done to mitigate or even reverse uh, this warming trend. Although, quite frankly, I've been talking about climate and climate change and global warming for about eight years now, and I've lost my hopes on uh, reversing the course. <laughs> but I think that uh, there is a possibility by trying to try to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So we'll talk about it toward the end. What you see here is a painting by the American journal uh, artist Emmanuel Lloyds. And he is uh, showing here General George Washington crossing the Delaware River on Christmas night, 1776. And as you can see, the Delaware River is covered with ice, which is something that was rather common at that time and that has not happened for the last 40 years, with the exception of this past winter. And if you look at other paintings of this time, you can see from Europe in particular, a lot of uh, representations of streams, rivers, canals that are, were completely frozen and people were ice skating. This is Rotterdam and, uh, in uh, 1825. And again, this is something that we have not seen for the last 50, 60, 70 years. So these paintings together with scientific evidence clearly indicate that climate was different toward the end of the 1700, beginning of 1800, than what we experience today, with the exception of this past winter, when we had an exceptional ice cover in the Great Lakes, for example, and as I mentioned earlier, the Delaware River was covered with ice. So by looking at this one and thinking about the past winter, one might wonder if this cold, the cold of the last two months is an indication that global warming has reached an end and we're now headed toward a global cooling. And the short answer to this is no. What we have experienced in January and February is a sequence of severe weather events that have happen more frequently than in the past several years, but that is still considered weather. It's not considered climate. So in order to understand this difference, we need to take a look at what scientists call weather and what we call climate. So weather is the condition of the atmosphere at a particular place and time, like if we look outside today, now, 
And it is measured in terms of wind, wind strength, wind direction, it's rather windy outside, uh, temperature, <coughs> humidity, atmospheric pressure, cloud cover, and precipitation. And we all know from personal experience, especially here in Michigan, that weather can change relatively rapidly. Yesterday morning, for example, I came to campus and it was cold and it was cloudy, and in the afternoon I left and it was warm and sunny. So weather changes from day to day, and it changes from hour to hour. Climate instead is the average pattern of weather in a place measured over 30 consecutive years. And because we use the average over 30 years, a particularly cold winter or a particularly warm summer do not determine a change in climate. There are simply times when we have unusual weather conditions for several weeks or for a couple of months. So with this in mind, you can understand that the cold winter that we are hopefully leaving behind us is not an indication of a climatic change. If we want to think about climatic change, we should record average temperature and precipitation, etc., for the next 30 years and see a trend of average colder and colder and colder winters and cooler summers. That would be a climatic change. Instead, if we look at a long record of climate, we see that on average, with some exceptions here and there, we have been going toward warmer and warmer temperatures. So a question that everybody should ask is, what is driving climate at a given location, or global climate and global temperatures? And the answer to this question is the balance between the energy that is coming from the sun and the energy that is radiated back toward the outer space by the Earth's surface. So in this slide, what you see with the yellow arrows is the incoming solar energy. It travels through space as electromagnetic radiation. The energy is mostly within the band of the visible light. The Earth, the sun's energy reaches the Earth's surface, warms up the Earth's surface, and then the Earth's surface radiates energy back toward the outer space, and you see these uh, red arrows here that show this energy that is radiated by the planet Earth. The energy radiated from, by Earth is on a longer wavelength. It's a little bit different. It's mostly infrared. So climate as we know it results from a balance between what is coming in and what is going out. Today, we are at an equilibrium. The amount of energy that, it come, that is coming in equals the amount of energy that is going out. If we alter in one way or another the incoming solar energy or the outgoing infrared radiation, then we will alter the energy balance and we will see a change in climate. Now, if this were the whole history, the whole story for climate, the average temperature of our planet will be around zero degrees Fahrenheit, which is rather chilly. In reality, the average temperature of the planet, of the entire planet, is about 59 degrees Fahrenheit. And so one wonders why this difference. After all, there is an energy balance, and I'll show you some numbers later on. And so what is giving us warmer temperatures than we expected? And the answer to this is the greenhouse effect, okay? Within the Earth's atmosphere, there are certain gases, they're called greenhouse gases. Carbon dioxide is one, it's the most popular, but we also have methane, CH4, and water vapor is also a greenhouse gas that trap the incoming solar energy and keep it recirculating between the ground and the atmosphere. And this extra energy gives us the higher average temperatures. So in this image here, you see what is coming in as energy from the sun in blue to your left, and what happens to the energy that is emitted by the Earth. So the first thing you see that we have 100 units, okay, that uh, are coming in. Some of this is absorbed by the atmosphere. 
about 30 units are reflected back to space. Now, reflection is a process by which a surface, the incoming solar energy bounces on a surface and then bounces back toward the outer space without transmitting energy. We call this in atmospheric science and climatology albedo, the ability of a surface to reflect energy instead of absorbing it. So what is sent out to the outer space is certainly not contributing to warming climate. And then on this other side, with the red and orange arrows, you see what happens instead to the energy that is radiated by the Earth's surface. And you should notice right away that these numbers here, what is radiated is substantially higher than what is absorbed coming from the sun. So how is it possible? Again, because of the greenhouse effect. You should see that, you should notice that there is this large number here with this thick fat arrow, but there is another one here that points downward that also gives us a significantly large number, almost double of what comes from the solar energy. If you like math, you can do a quick calculation, add up what is coming in, what is going out, you will see that its state are equal. You can also add up what is being absorbed, what is released, and again, you come up with the same numbers. But the key point here is that there is loop, this loop that keeps the energy within the Earth system and keeps the Earth warm. And this is the greenhouse effect. And without the greenhouse effect, we would have global average temperature around zero degrees Fahrenheit. So the greenhouse effect is good for us. Okay. I like to compare a greenhouse effect to chocolate chip ice cream, <laughs> which I love. <laughs> a little bit is good for your health. Too much is a problem. Okay. So by looking at these, and don't focus on the numbers, but just looking at these arrows, you can see immediately that climate can change if we alter this equilibrium of energy coming in and energy going out. And this can be changed from outside the Earth by changing this, what is coming in, okay? We know that periodically the sun has a higher number of sunspots. And when the number of sunspots increases, the amount of energy released by the sun increases as well. When the number of sunspots decrease, the sun releases a lower amount of energy. So this is periodic and that affects the amount of incoming solar energy and the solar climate. We also know that on longer time scale, uh, changes in the position of the Earth with respect to the sun, <coughs> excuse me, will alter the amount of incoming solar energy and the distribution of solar energy. So we talk about orbital changes which occur about every 100,000 years, we can change the amount of energy that is reflected that will also produce a climatic change, okay? If we change the nature of the surface of the Earth, for example, by melting ice, ice is white and has a very high albedo. If you ever try to walk in the snow, go skiing on a sunny day, you wear sunglasses because you have all this light that is reflected toward your eyes. So if we reduce the white surface by melting the glaciers, for example, then we reduce this number here, which means that more energy will stay within the climate system and produce its own warming, independently of what happens with the greenhouse gases. And then again, obviously, we can change the concentration of greenhouse gases. If we have more greenhouse gases, this number here, will go up, and this number here will go up, and we will have global warming. If we reduce the number of greenhouse gases, this number here and this number here will increase, and this instead will decrease, and we will have global cooling. Now I mentioned that I am a paleoclimatologist, so I could not help myself. I have to give you an example of how climate has changed in the past, and compare it to what we have seen in the last 200 years. So what you see here is the temperature record in black uh, in Antarctica at a site that is called Etka. And uh, we go from, to, oh, sorry. 
We go from today, which is approximately here, <coughs> all the way to 800,000 years ago. And what we see here are these periodic changes in temperature. Warmer temperatures are at the top, colder temperatures are at the bottom. And these are the glacial interglacial cycles. Okay? I think every Michigander knows that around 20,000 years ago, so approximately here, Ann Arbor and Michigan, and most of Michigan, and south of Michigan, we had a big ice cap about two kilometers over our head. Okay? So what you see here are these periodic changes. They're relatively regular, about every 100,000 years, and these are due to changes in the configuration of the Earth's orbit. Every 100,000 years, the shape of the orbit changes a little bit and gives to Earth, especially the northern hemisphere, more incoming solar energy, and we have a natural warming, and so we have a warm interglacial like today. And then 80,000 years later, we have, we are in the middle of an ice age or glacial maximum, okay? And then it gets warmer again. So these are natural climatic changes, and we know what's the cause, changes in the Earth's orbit. What is interesting here, though, is that Antarctica is covered by an ice cap, and these data come from ice cores. Ice cores have air bubbles trapped in them, and the air bubbles represent samples of the atmosphere in the past. So we have been able to measure the concentration of greenhouse gases in the past, back to about a million years ago, no more than that, unfortunately. And what you see here is the concentration of carbon dioxide, and in red, the concentration of methane, two powerful greenhouse gases. And what you see is that every time temperatures are warmer, we have more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and more methane in the atmosphere. And every time we have an ice age or a glacial maximum, there is less carbon dioxide and less methane in the atmosphere. So if we look at the geologic record, at the long history of climate, there is a very good correlation between concentrations of greenhouse gases and global average temperature. I also want to point out where we are today. So today, February 2014, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was 394 parts per million, higher than what you see here. Okay, when I graduated with my bachelor, it was 330 parts per million. So that gives you an idea of how much it has changed, and methane is also a little bit higher. Notice that these values have never been seen with natural changes for the last million years. In fact, Earth has had more carbon dioxide, but we have to go back to the time of the dinosaurs, when climate was very different and there were big blizzards. Okay, everything was very different. So, what is also interesting, at least to me, is that if we magnify the last thousand years, this relationship between carbon dioxide, which is in blue, and average global temperature is still true. We still have variability, interannual variability, in uh, average temperatures here, and a carbon dioxide here relatively low, and then all of a sudden carbon dioxide starts increasing and temperature start increasing as well. And this part here is what we call global warming. Okay? Now, it is important to understand two things. One, here we're looking at the last 1,000 years. So at this time scale, the effects due to changes in the Earth's orbit do not play a major role. That happens every 100,000 years. We're only looking at 1,000. So that does not affect this part of the record, okay? However, shorter changes like sunspots are still visible in this record. If we magnify now the last 200 years, which is what you see here, what you have in green and blue is carbon dioxide since the 1900. And here in red, you have the average temperatures. And so what you see is that at a certain point in the 1900, carbon dioxide starts increasing. And look at the temperature increase. 
is very rapid and it's very significant. And what happens here is that there are two forcing mechanisms that are working together between the 1920s and, and uh, 1945 approximately, which are increasing carbon dioxide and an increase in sunspot activity. And so together they produce a warming larger than expected with the single, single, single carbon dioxide. And then you see a plateau here, and this is us. This is 1942, 1975. We polluted the atmosphere heavily. A lot of particulate matter entered the atmosphere, and that produced a lot of solar dimming. A lot of energy was reflected back to the outer space at that time. And therefore, temperatures cooled a little bit or did not warm at all. Okay, a couple of volcanic activities help put in more ash into the atmosphere. But past 1975, when sunspot activity goes down and we put filters on the smokestacks that were producing all that particular matter, and so we clean up the atmosphere, now what you see is that the warming goes very well with the concentration of carbon dioxide. Okay, and so this is the interval where scientists are basically sure that this is the result of anthropogenic activity. Everything else is, is out of the way. And since 1975, 1980s, we have this runaway warming that goes along with carbon dioxide. Now you might wonder, how do we know for sure that it's us? Couldn't this be another process? Could there be something that we don't know yet and we have yet to discover that is producing this warming? And so we have several lines of evidence that show that it is us, it's human activities. And I'll show you three, because we only have a limited amount of time. But one is what I call arithmetic. We know exactly how much fossil fuels we have been burning since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And as you can see, we can even subdivide them in different types of fossil fuels. And you see that there is a warming with more fossil fuels, and then the rapid warming afterward with a dramatic increase in the burning of fossil fuels. So that's evidence one. The second one, we have to look at chemistry, and in particular at the chemistry of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is CO2. And carbon is present in the atmosphere in three different species. One is carbon-12, very common, the most abundant. The second one is carbon-13, which is stable, not that abundant. The fourth one, some of you might have heard about it in high school, carbon-14, radiometric dating. So that is an unstable isosol. So what is interesting about these different types of carbon is that when plants photosynthesize an algae, they are selective in the type of carbon they like. They take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere during photosynthesis, but those carbon dioxide molecules that they take in are predominantly the ones that carry carbon fiber for a number of reasons. They move eat more easily through the enzymes, etc., etc., etc. So when you look at a tree, when you look at algae and that organic carbon, it is mostly carbon fiber. Our fossil fuels are produced by the decomposition of organic material that is mainly produced by algae and plants. So when we burn the fossil fuels, we produce carbon dioxide that is rich in carbon-12 because that's the matter that we have. And so what scientists have done, they have checked how the concentration of carbon-12 has increased or decreased or not changed in the atmosphere. And for the time interval where we have a record starting in the 80s, what you see is that the amount of carbon-12 has increased along with they increase in carbon dioxide concentrations. There is no other source so rich in carbon that can add carbon power to the atmosphere. Not volcanic eruptions. A lot of people bring up volcanic eruption, not with this particular signature. 
Okay, this is definitely burning of the fossil fuels. And last but not least, a little surprising, the concentration of oxygen in the atmosphere has decreased, not in an alarming way. We have plenty of oxygen. We're not going to lose oxygen anytime soon. But again, if you look at the data, you see that the burning of the fossil fuels has produced a concurrent decrease in oxygen concentration that is opposite to the trend in increase in carbon dioxide. Okay, so again, this third evidence points at us. It is the result of human activities. So what do we do now? Oops, we are in a box, right? What we do now and the results of what we do now strongly depend on the political, unfortunately, mostly political decisions that will be made in the next 10 to 20 years. Okay, what you see here is a graph that shows the change in global average temperatures up to the year 2000. You cannot read the number here, but it says 2000. So these are measured and estimated from ice cores. And then what you see here are different scenarios used that have been produced by climate models. So the climate models have been developed, then they have been tested by looking at if they can reproduce what we know already happened. And once they can do it well, then we try to use them to project what could happen in the future. And so here, there are four options. One, if we stop emissions, we keep the emission levels at the point where we are now. This is for the year 2000. Today, we're a little bit higher. Okay, so shift this a little bit higher. So what would happen if we could all agree not to reduce the emissions? Right, that's a crazy idea. Nobody wants to give up anything. But let's keep the emissions where they are. Are we going to reverse global warming? And the answer is no. Even if we keep the emissions constant, the warming will continue. It will be by the year 2100, which is uh, down here, um, it will be a fraction of a degree Celsius, so not that much, but it will continue. Why? Because of this albedo effect, that the ice is melting itself in some way, reflecting more energy, shrinking, reflect less energy, more energy stays in the system, is warmer, more ice melts, lower albedo, more energy stays in the system, and so on. So that's one factor. And the other factor is the oceans, which cover more than 70% of the Earth's surface, and take a long time to warm up and cool down. Okay, so the oceans are still, they're like a thermal flywheel that has, that have a delay in response to the warming. So, if we're a little bit more realistic or pessimistic, I'm thinking of getting older and getting more pessimistic, here are three other scenarios which keep into account changes in carbon dioxide plus new technologies, plus what other energy sources we can use, etc. And so what you can see is that with a low growth, everybody behaves in a good manner. We all come to an agreement uh, very easily. We would have a change, a warming that is a little bit below two degrees Celsius, okay? Instead, if we go to the worst scenario where everybody wants to grow their economy and who cares about climate and global warming, and populations along the coast and underdeveloped areas. Well, in that case, again, you don't see the number here, unfortunately, but we get close to about four degrees Celsius change. Okay, and that is significant. Scientists are concerned about this, and they are trying to convince politicians that we should do everything we can to keep the change below the two degrees Celsius just because the warming of the atmosphere is so large on average. We're talking about average. So we're not talking about how much it is at low latitudes versus high latitudes. These two degrees will be higher, will be more for the Arctic than from, for the equator. The equator is already very close to its maximum, but the Arctic is not. So what scientists indeed think that we are already seeing some impacts of global warming. 
This image here, which I think is beautiful, it looks like a painting, um, is uh, a satellite image of um, Pakistan in the summer of 2010, when there was a, the flooding of the century, okay? And the gray bluish areas that you see here, the colors are a little bit altered, but if you go online and check this out, they're, it's beautiful blue color. That is standing water. And for a few days, this area was the largest freshwater lake in the world. That's how much water poured down on these people. About 2,000 people died in that flooding. At the same time, in Russia, they had one of the warmest heat waves of the century with incredibly warm temperatures, and about 10,000 people died in Moscow in a matter of a few weeks. And at that time, scientists all agree that this type of severe event is a consequence of global warming, and we're just starting to see the beginning. Okay? Um, so, what are possible impacts? of global warming. We would need another lecture to talk about them. So I have a list here. I'll give you a hint about what we should expect for the future. And then we will focus on four that are the ones that are a more immediate concern. But as you can see, warmer temperatures will affect the atmosphere and the land. We will have more frequent and more intense heat waves more frequent and stronger severe weather events, and you think hurricanes and tornadoes, the science is still out in regard to hurricanes. A paper, I read a paper that was published a couple of months ago about tornadoes instead, and linking tornadoes to warmer temperatures in the Pacific. And um, you're probably, you might be aware of this, but tornadoes are very difficult to see and, and forecast. In reality, you don't know that there has been a tornado until somebody goes out in the field and report that there has been a tornado touchdown. Because they're so small that the system we have cannot detect them. Um, more droughts and floods for us in Michigan, lower lake levels, warmer temperatures in the lakes that will affect invasive species and will affect productivity in the lakes. If you like to go fishing, this will affect your fishing, your recreation. Um, for the oceans, we have rising sea level and ocean acidification. We'll talk about this more, and loss of biodiversity. We're concerned about the ice caps and glaciers because of this effect on albedo, loss of polar and subpolar habitats, and loss of snowpack, which is a water resource, a very important water resource. And this will all eventually affect society. Global warming is really a societal issue. As a paleoclimatologist, I can tell you, Earth has seen warmer climate than now, and it has been doing just fine. But what global warming is going to do is impact the way we live. And so we need to be aware of that. It's going to be more expensive. It will be more unpredictable. You might not be able to go fishing, for example, or go to the beach to the usual place. So what we think is going to happen are changes in the duration of the seasons, which will affect crops. So we will have summer starting sooner and ending later. Winter will not be that cold. So what this will also do, favor the expansion of infectious diseases. And most people, when they hear the word infectious diseases, they think immediately malaria <coughs> and cholera. Well, there's also Lyme disease, which is spreading farther north. And that is becoming more common in Michigan. Do you guys know what Lyme disease is? Okay, you get it from a tick bite. So ticks are doing very well. They're spreading north. There are more, they're more common, especially in southeast Michigan, and they can transmit this Lyme disease. So it's not something that is that far away from us. Okay, we don't need to get into malaria to think about this type of disease. Loss of coastal areas due to rising sea level, expansion of invasive and non-invasive species. Think about the bark beetle. 
The bark beetle is not an invasive species, but it's favored, the favored population growth is favored by warmer temperatures because more individuals survive the winter, which is warmer, and so there are more of them that are able to attack a tree, and they can overcome the tree defenses within about three to four days, and then the pine tree is doomed. Okay, so that is not an invasive species. That is a local species. But again, climate changes, conditions quite change, and the species is favored over trees, especially when it spreads northward and it runs into trees that have never had the encounter with this species, and so they're not, don't have all the protections that other trees might have developed. I read a paper a couple of years ago about conflict, especially civil war. When people don't like each other, and it gets really warm in the summer, they're more likely to start fighting. And so they see there is a relationship documented between El Nino years when global temperatures are warmer and the number of social, of uh, civil wars in areas that are at low latitudes. Migrations and water resources will be affected. So we'll focus on a few things. So we have rising sea level. This is a picture of the outer banks after hurricanes or extra tropical storm at that point, uh, Sandy. And uh, you can barely tell where the ocean is and where the sound is. Uh, what you see here is this was probably a house on the beach. There are higher waves. Again, you don't see them very well in this, uh, with this um, projector, but that's probably where um, the ocean is. And so this will be the sound. So with rising sea level, we will, um, we have seen already an increase in sea level uh, of about um, 20 centimeters for the last 200 years. This graph shows until 1880 approximately, this is estimate. These are actual measurements in red that have been taken at harbors by tidal doges. And then in green here, you see satellite. So again, warmer temperatures, higher sea level. The higher sea level that we see, 20 centimeters, which is about eight inches higher on average. It's not the same everywhere. Uh, it's mainly due to the thermal expansion of water. This is also something that is not always very well known. Everybody thinks about the melting glaciers, right? Well, most of the rising sea level is due to the fact that warmer water in the ocean expands and therefore stands higher. The oceans cover more than 70% more than of the Earth's surface. The average depth of the ocean is 4,000 meters. So you can imagine if a little bit of that water, the one at the surface, expands because it gets warmer, sea level goes up, rises globally. And then we also have melting of the ice above sea level. The ice that is already in the water is already displacing water. So as it melts, the water replaces the ice. But what comes from above sea level, Greenland, Antarctica, glaciers, that does contribute to an increase in sea level. So what you see here are again the projections for the future. And so if, we, if we're good, if we limit our emissions, we will have the lowest increase in sea level, about another 20 centimeters, another eight inches by the year 2100. If instead we go with a high growth scenario here, we're going to see an increase of about 50 centimeters, which uh, will be significant. And this will come along with a significant loss of land. I like this image that shows the modern shoreline. I'm not sure where this is along the east coast. Then you see where sea level will be in 2030 and where it will be in 2050. So think about the loss of land, of recreational possibilities, tourists coming to spend the summer here, and all the consequences. Coastal communities are at risk. They, um, communities that are on um, deltas are at risk as well. Every low-lying area is in danger of being flooded. Uh, small islands in the Pacific, for example, and in the Indian Ocean run the risk of disappearing completely. Think about where these people are going to 
go once they lose their country, okay, which is a small country, but still it's their country. Um, and then we, this will impact water resources. And it will impact water resources because most of the communities along the shore, on the coast, get their water from wells. And as the sea level rises, underneath the sand, the water moves toward the land as well. And once salt water reaches the well, you have to abandon the well. There is no way to remove salt from the well. So this will set, certainly affect um, what is happening in these areas. Dear to me is ocean acidification. What you see in this picture is a phytoplankton bloom in the North Atlantic. What is happening here, these little teeny tiny algae that you see here, they're called coccolithophores, twice a year find the perfect conditions of water temperature, nutrients, food, and solar energy to start reproducing very quickly. And if you look at these under the microscope, they're white. And so when you have millions of these in the water, they reflect the solar energy and they make the water look white, almost white, and you can see this from a satellite. So these are organisms that build these plates made of calcium carbonate, they're photosynthetic. They are the most important photosynthetic organisms in the ocean, and the ocean transfer oxygen to the atmosphere, so they're very important for photosynthesis, removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. They're not the only ones. We also have other organisms, animal-like, that live in the ocean and produce hard parts made of calcium carbonate. And if you wonder what calcium carbonate is, if you ever held a piece of chalk in your hand, that's calcium carbonate, okay? So these are theropods, they're also called sea butterflies. They're beautiful, they float in the ocean. These are foraminifera, and these are corals. So what is happening? This these three here, the coccolithophores, the pteropods, and the forums, are at the base of the food chain. Okay, so it, without this, we would have a severe impact on the ocean food chain. And uh, what is happening is that the ocean is in equilibrium when it comes to carbon dioxide, the surface of the ocean with the atmosphere. So more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere means that more carbon dioxide has moved into the ocean. And in reality, about 40% of the carbon dioxide added by the burning of the fossil fuels has ended up in the ocean, which is good. Otherwise, it will be warmer. However, when carbon dioxide enters ocean water, reacts with water, and produces a weak acid, and it's called the carbonic acid. And the carbonic acid tends to dissolve calcium carbonate. And so what we have, we're starting to see, especially with these sea butterflies that have a very thin shell, is that the shells are thinner, the calcium carbonate shells are thinner, that the growth is slowing down significantly. Some of these organisms have very, very thin shells, and we are very concerned about a large decrease in the rate of growth of these organisms that might affect those phytoplankton blooms that we have seen that still see in the background and affect the ocean food chain. We don't know very well what is going to happen. The oceans are very slow to respond, so we will need a little bit more time to figure out exactly what the consequences are. We corals between the warming and the increase in the lowering of the ocean pH, we've seen the coral bleaching, where the zooxanthellae leave the coral and stop feeding the polyp, and the corals basically die. Another thing, aspect that is dear to my heart is the loss of Arctic ice. And we talk about sea ice. We're not looking at Greenland here. We're looking at the ice in the Arctic Ocean. The Arctic Ocean um, is an area where we have large fluctuations in the ice cover. The ice cover is larger during the winter, and then the ice melts during the summer. The problem is that with global warming, warmer temperatures in the Arctic have increased the rate of melting in the summer 
in the Arctic. So less of the Arctic Ocean is covered by ice, which affects albedo once again and starts that self-perpetuating process, which is called a positive feedback. We had the historical low, record low, September 2012. 2013 was a little bit better. September is when we have the minimum ice cover. And here you see what was the ice cover in September 1975, okay? So there is a large loss of ice, and this is affecting habitat. The most famous impacted species in this case are the, the polar bears. The Latin name of polar bear is Ursus peritimus. That means the bear that lives in the water. And the problem for the polar bears is that one, they have to swim longer to go from one floating ice to chunk of floating ice to the other. So they're spending more energy, which means that they need to eat more. But at the same time, the seals, which are their favorite food, are decreasing in numbers because the loss of ice is reducing their habitat. So while the bears need more food, there is actually less food available. Believe it or not, the loss of ice in the Arctic is also affecting us. And again, this winter, this past winter, is a clear evidence. We think it's uh, in support of this um, theory. And what you see here in this beautiful image, there is an animation actually online and it's really beautiful. This ribbon that is red and yellow shows the jet streams, which are high altitude winds. The jet streams blow from west to east and they separate cold air to the north from warm air to the south. They are here because there is a difference in atmospheric pressure between the high latitudes, the polar latitudes, and the mid latitudes. Air here is colder, denser, higher pressure, thanks also to the ice and albedo. And here instead we have warmer air and lower pressure. The pressure difference between these two areas keep the jet streams flowing. Now, when the Arctic is warmer, the pressure difference, it's called the pressure gradient, decreases. And when this happens, it looks like the jet streams start developing these troughs and ridges that go way deep into the south and then into the north. They slow down and they get stuck in place, which means that this situation can persist for several weeks. Now, if you are under a ridge, you're going to have persistent warm conditions and possibly dry conditions which will favor wildfires in the uh, Pacific Southwest. If you are instead north of the jet stream, then you're going to have Arctic air and very cold conditions. That's the polar vortex that has invaded Michigan, okay? So what we think is that with loss of Arctic ice, these troughs and ridges will be accentuated, the jet stream will slow down, will be stuck in place more often, and we will see more weather, not climate, weather extremes. So again, the past cold winter is the result of global warming, even if it's almost unbelievable, right? And then I think I'm out of time. So droughts and desertification are also an expect consequence. Uh, we will have more flooding. We've seen Pakistan. We will also have more droughts. It all depends on where those atmospheric currents go. Um, so we will have higher frequency of prolonged droughts. Uh, that will change, the change in the precipitation patterns will impact local populations, will impact the crops that people can grow in different areas. And in some areas, in some marginal deserts, it will um, exacerbate what is called desertification, which is a movement of a desertic area toward higher latitudes. This is due in part to the practices that are used to grow crops, which tend to uh, remove nutrients from the soil very quickly, but it's also impacted 
by global warming. And in some way, this desertification is kind of favoring global warming because if you have a smaller plant growth, that means reduced photosynthesis, which means that more carbon dioxide will stay in the atmosphere and favor global warming. So by 2020, between 75 and 250 million people in Africa are projected to be exposed to increased water stress, a consequence of this prolonged drought. If you have a lot of drought and you, you don't have access to freshwater resources, this is true for Africa, but it's also true for the southwestern part of the US. Yields from agriculture might be reduced by as much as 50% in some regions. So what do we do? I love this image. The latest idea, put solar panels on the moon where they can collect energy all day long and then transfer that energy to receiving stations on the surface of the earth as infrared radiation from where the energy will be converted into usable energy and distributed to the entire world. The Japanese are looking into this after the fiasco with nuclear plants and we all know how that went. Very expensive, very futuristic. In between, <laughs> we have a number of choices and we don't have time to discuss this in detail, but all, all I've been hearing a lot, as I said, I've been talking about this for eight years to reduce emissions and the total effect has been zero, okay? <laughs> Nothing. If you look at the rate of emission increase, it has been constant from the year 2000 until the year 2013. Nothing has changed. So that's why I'm saying I'm a little pessimistic. How much are we going to reduce? Who goes first? Who's going to start? Not me. You start. And how much is it going to cost? Alternative energy resources, solar, wind, waste, tides, nuclear, they probably will not over produce the same amount of energy that is produced by um, fossil fuels. And so I'm more hopeful for a removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and the technology is already there. You're thinking to get the carbon dioxide before it enters the atmosphere and push it uh, and um, inject it into old oil wells, so put it in the rocks, away. Uh, increase the Earth's reflectivity, I'm a little bit skeptical. We know that if you put particular matter, put small particles in the atmosphere, they will reflect the incoming solar energy and reduce albedo, and that should produce the cooling. And again, last but not least, install, install solar panels on the moon. I think it's a good idea, isn't it? I love that. It's very expensive. My grandchildren maybe will see that. Okay. Well, thank you for being patient and for listening. If you have any questions.